Welcome to Aurora Public Library's virtual living room, where we're about to have a conversation with academic, author, and public speaker, Dr. Cheryl Thompson. My name is Risha Mandelkorn, and I will be hosting this evening's event. We'll begin with a few questions, followed by a short reading from Dr. Thompson's latest book, Uncle, and then we'll open up the question and answer period to what I know will be a lively discussion. Please feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And uh, you could start actually as we're going through the conversation, put your questions in and we'll get to them at the end. Dr. Cheryl Thompson is an assistant professor at Ryerson University in the School of Creative Industries. She is the author of Beauty in a Box, Detangling the Roots of Canada's Black Beauty Culture, and her just released book, Uncle, Race, Nostalgia, and the Politics of Loyalty was listed as one of the Globe and Mail's top 36 fiction and nonfiction books to read in 2021. Dr. Thompson's essays have appeared in many feminist and media journals. She's published in The Conversation, Toronto Star, Montreal Gazette, Spacing, Horizons Magazine, Halifax Coast, and Rabble.ca. Welcome, Dr. Thompson. This is such an honor. Thank you for joining us this evening. No, thank you so much for inviting me. So I'm going to begin with some of the broader issues, uh, historical, current, and, and future. Um, so my first question is, the struggle for civil rights has been fought on many fronts, and history can misremember or, in hindsight, require a new lens. As we consider the influence of Dr. Martin Luther King, the Black Panther Party, and Black Lives Matter activists, would you share some thoughts about these different movements? Yes, I mean, you know, all of those those movements that you listed sort of had a different push pull to them. Um, so I can explain that. So if we think about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who, you know, really is probably one of the most um, remembered civil rights activists of the 20th century, um, you know, his reason for embroiling himself into this conversation on civil rights really happened because of Rosa Parks and her refusal to move to the back of the bus in Montgomery, Alabama. At that time, Dr. King was a young minister. You know, he really wasn't an activist in, the, in that sense. But given the time and the circumstances, he was also um, in Atlanta in the South. Things kind of convalesced where he embroiled himself and he became part of the movement. And then he was elected, right? They, they chose him to lead the movement to desegregate the bus system in Montgomery, Alabama. And then from there, there were other civil rights issues that, that came up that he embroiled himself in. The Black Panther Party is coming out of men, like about five or six years, uh, actually it's about 10 years later, and it's about three years after the March on Washington in 1963. And the Black Panther Party is basically saying, we're not radical enough. This passive um, resistance and sort of the, the means for which Dr. King and others were doing, were trying to push change, they were just tired of it. And they said, we needed to be militant, we need to be radical, and we needed to push an agenda that was actually more about Black liberation and not necessarily acceptance into the white dominant culture through integration. So the Black Panther Party was not really about integration. They were about sort of a kind of almost a self-emancipation. And so you have these two forces in the 1960s, one that starts the decade, Dr. King, and then the Black Panther Party that kind of ends, like book ends the decade with very different um, reasons for being, right? And a very different politics. And then in the 1970s, it's, it's as if they both just kind of disappeared <laughs> off the national and the international page. It doesn't mean on a local level that there wasn't still organizing. It just wasn't talked about in the same way. Now you mentioned at the end there, Black Lives Matter. And I think we have to understand that Black Lives Matter is really responding to, um, I would say there's one impetus for Black Lives Matter and it's police brutality against unarmed black men and women. Black Lives Matter is not the same context of Dr. King that was against segregation, the Black Panther Party that was about self-emancipation. And now we have this 
other activist group that is really hyper-focused on policing and just criminality in general and the, the social justice system. And so I think when we, we think about all those groups, they're responding to their times. And in, in, in what seems to be the issues of our time is the sense that um, while the civil rights movement of Martin Luther King Jr. tried to address issues related to integration and getting black people access into education and, and, and healthcare and all, the, all of that, the Black Panther Party was very much interested in knowledge and what came out of the Black Panther Party was a lot of Black authors, a lot of Angela Davis being the most prominent of them. A lot of Black cultural production was the result of the Black Panthers. BLM is really pointing a spotlight on the fact that we have never really addressed our correctional systems and our social justice systems in a way that has been, um, um, that has recognized Black lives fully. So I think those movements, if, as I've laid it out, they're very different, right? And, but at the same time, they're still rooted in the same sense of, of seeking justice for things that are seeming, that Black community feel have not been equitable for a very long time. Okay, thank you. Um, so you, I follow you on Twitter and you recently tweeted about how the dominant culture celebrates Black male martyrs but does not take into account the wider movement. Could you elaborate on this? Yes, and you know, some people might hear that and think, wow, that's a very um, salacious comment. <laughs> and I mean, what I mean by that is that if we think, and this is where the book, when we get into the book, this is where it really comes from. You know, Uncle Tom is probably the most celebrated black martyr of all time. You know, he takes his abuse, he takes his, his, his violence, that's, he takes the violence that's enacted against him. And now if we step forward and think about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., while this is a transformational figure, in a way, he did the same thing. He took the violence that was enacted upon him. All those clubs and beatings and, and being hosed and going to jail, he took it and he never fought back and he never spoke an ill word of anyone. And so that has tended to resonate within the dominant culture as the right way to protest or the right way to be an activist is to, is, to be, is to be kind, is to be nice, is to be pleasant. Whereas for anyone who's a studied history knows that change actually doesn't really happen solely through passive resistance. You also need violence. Like you also need there to be an eruption, almost like chaos and anger. People have to express their anger and you have to confront people. So that level of, outward like confrontation has just never tended to resonate much in the dominant culture as something that would be celebrated, right? And I think if we really think about it, you know, that is one of the reasons why if there is a really militant black group, they often get framed as if they are a terrorist group. And I've actually heard Republicans in the US refer to Black Lives Matter as a terrorist group, even though it's in response to police brutality against black people because their means of doing it is very aggressive. They get framed in a very negative way. It, whereas when you sort of take your beats and you die through, by them, you tend to be remembered as a noble figure. And I think there's just something that we need to think about in that, you know, like there's just something to that um, that, that shouldn't go on. Um, ignored. Okay, thank you. So in, in your first book, Beauty in a Box, Detangling the Roots of Canada's Black Beauty Culture, you explore how race, gender, and class have complicated the often charged relationship between Black women and their hair. So for some, it's a matter of personal style, and, and for others, Black hair is imbued with political meaning. Could you speak to this, please? Yeah, so you know, a lot of people often when they hear the, the discussion about black women and hair, they think, oh, why are they always talking about their hair? Like, what is the big deal? It's just hair. You know, I, I mean, I've even he I've heard this said to me also, and I think to myself, yes, but you have to understand people of African descent, typically, I mean, there are people of other ethnic groups as well, but typically, people of African descent are really the only people who have coiled textured hair. And so that means whenever your child goes to school, they are the only person in that classroom who has that textured hair. 
and and when everybody's looking at the movies, right? Think about all the commercials that you see throughout your life. They're in the shower. They're just flipping their hair back and they're they're having the time of their life and they're flipping their hair. If you're a young black girl, you can't do that. That is not an aesthetic that you can a aspire to unless you do something to alter yourself. So you have to actually change who you are to be able to replicate that same aesthetic of being able to flip your hair. And so what that means is, is that our hair is always imbued with so much meaning because we have to change it. <laughs> if we want to achieve sort of levels of success that mirror the dominant culture, we have to change who we are. Or we have to do what I've done in wearing my hair as in locks, kind of just, you know, come to terms with the fact that you're going to be making a statement everywhere you go. <laughs> When I go to the airport, when I go to maybe communities that, that aren't used to seeing um, many Black people, I'm going to be stared at. I just have to come to terms with that my aesthetic is going gonna, is gonna, to um, attract a kind of attention that is more, that's not good attention. <laughs> like they're not staring at me thinking, oh, her hair is so beautiful. <laughs> they're staring at me thinking, why does her hair look like that? What is that about? Is she a militant? You know, and, and, and what happens is with black women as well, and even black men too, if you wear a hair, your hair in a certain hairstyle, sometimes people automatically assume that you're aggressive, that you're, that you're maybe in a gang, <laughs> depending on what it is. So they, they equate our hair now with very negative things. And so that means if you're the wearer of that hairstyle, you're always up against this outward perception of who you are everywhere you go and every day of your life. And so, you know, imagine over decades, yeah, that does start to wear, wear on a person and you start to wonder like, you know, what's going on, <laughs> you know? And so black hair for that reason is always political because even when you decide to alter your hair, you're making a political act in doing that because you're basically saying that you, you think your chances of social, cultural, economic success will be improved if you do this and then if you do the opposite so then if you take an oppositional stance that's also political because then you're basically rejecting <laughs> everything that you've been told that you're supposed to do so you can't really get out of the conversation of it not being a political having political meaning thank you so i'd like to bring the conversation to your newest book uncle race nostalgia and the politics of loyalty this book is so political and necessary in the post-Trump era. You write about the influence of Uncle Tom has had on two centuries of racial politics. Can you elaborate on that, please? Yes. I mean, what a grandiose frame, right? <laughs> like, I, I think to myself, now that the book has been written, I think, wow, how, how, how much chutzpah did I have to embroil myself, not only in the U.S., history, but also U.S. political culture to some extent. And, you know, to be honest, I've been writing for a while now. And one of the things that I've realized is that if you want to be a good writer, you just writer, you have to go for it. Like you have to just own that these are the words that are coming out of your mouth. And so when I decided to write this book, it was actually around 2018. It started. So that would have been the midterms of like Donald Trump when things kind of shifted and then suddenly you had like a Republican like Senate, like they, they basically ran the right White House and there was a lot coming out, conspiracy theories and all this other stuff. And then I just started to notice, especially at Donald Trump's rallies, the type of black men that he would highlight at his rallies and who would be, who would be there in the first place and the way they spoke and the things they said. And then I was paying attention to some of his appointees such as Dr. Um, ben Carson and, and just some other people. And I started to think, you know, there's like a type of person that I'm seeing here. There's a type of person that is, it's reminding me of people that I, that I was warned about when I was a kid. And so I was going back into my childhood, how I've always known about Uncle Tom. I'm sure everyone who's here tonight, for whatever reason, you know who Uncle Tom is. 
even if you've never read Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, it's like you just know. And I thought to myself, why is it I know who Uncle Tom is, but I don't really know the story of why I still know who Uncle Tom is. And I know it comes from Harriet Beecher Stowe's 1852 novel, but the Uncle Tom that I'm seeing in my present life doesn't really seem like the Uncle Tom of the novel. So I was just very curious at the, those two bookends that I just talked about the novel from 1852 and the present day 21st century Uncle Tom that people like how they hurl that word at people. And I just wanted to fill in the blanks in between and, and go on a little bit of a journey myself through a lot of histories that I've already knew because of my first book, like Beauty in a Box does address a lot of the 1920th century in terms of like cultural and media culture. So I, I kind of was going back over the same terrain, but instead of, of using beauty culture as my lens, I wanted to use this fictive character as my lens to kind of make sense of a lot of things. So when you do read the book, what you'll see is I use this character to make sense of reconstruction era in the US, Jim Crow segregation, um, the railway porters, the Pullman porters, um, I even talk about Aunt Jemima and consumer culture. And then I get into like the cream of wheat icon and, and, un and Uncle Ben. Um, and then I go through the 40s and then I talk about Song of the South, Disney's Song of the South, which is a film that most people haven't seen, but yet they know what it is, right? Just say zippity doodah and everyone's like, oh, I've heard that song before. I talk about that too, Uncle Remus. And then I wanted to understand how the 1960s moment of the civil rights era, how that actually created an anti-Tom figure in the embodiment of Muhammad Ali, who was everything that Uncle Tom is not. And if you, if anyone out here is a boxing fan, which I am a huge boxing fan, um, Muhammad Ali would call his opponents Uncle Tom. He would use that in, in the pre, the buildup to the fight. And he would say, I'm fighting this Uncle Tom. And so he even started to invoke it. And then it started to take on a different tone. So then I investigated that because I just thought that is a turning point. And then I realized as you get into the 70s and 80s, you have these celebrity figures like OJ Simpson, Bill Cosby um, in the 90s, Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods. And then here we get all the way up to Obama, who was also accused of being an Uncle Tom. And in the book, I kind of explain that I don't think he is. I think that's a, 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 not a correct assessment of him. But the point is, is that I realized that all of these figures actually have mutated and changed the original Uncle Tom. But they're doing something that is still connected to the original Uncle Tom. I can't tell you, I mean, you have to read the book, but I kind of tease it out in the book, like really meticulously, I tease it out through the decades. And, and you know, I, yes, I wrote Beauty in a Box, but that was really focused on the beauty culture industry. So I, I do skip like a lot of histories. This was the first book that I had written where it's like, I, I, I feel kind of proud of myself, how I stayed in the, in the time period for very long periods of time. Like there's a good chunk of the book that really is, you know, in the 1890s to 1920s. Like it's about three or four chapters, like just in that 30 year period. And then there's about three or four chapters that are the 1970s and 80s, like really in depth stuff. And I did that because I wanted, I wanted to, I wanted to take my time and I didn't want to rush through the like the arguments that I was trying to make I wanted to basically I remember at the end my editor <laughs> he was just like because I the writing the conclusion is always the hardest part of a book because how do you conclude something that is actually not finished you just have to kind of wrap up what it is you wanted people to take from the book and he was like you have given an exhaustive account you don't need to recount that in the conclusion so when he said that to me, I kind of felt good. Like, yeah, okay, I think I left no stone unturned. I mean it. Like if there's anything Uncle Tom you have ever wondered, it is literally in the book. Like I have left nothing out. And, and I'm proud about that, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's on order at the library and I am the first one that's going to get it. And then everybody else can get other copies, but I will do the first read <laughs> <laughs> yes. because it is so very new. Um, so, so when, when the prime minister was outed for appearing in blackface, you wrote, I'm going to read it. 
If we keep it real for a minute, Trudeau is not the first or last white male to darken their skin in supposed jest. As someone who has spent the last 10 years studying blackface in Canada, the one thing I know to be true is that blackface is as Canadian as hockey. <laughs> what a quote. <laughs> how does wow. blackface, how, it's yours. How does blackface shape how we see black men, not only in the States, but at home here in Canada? Yeah, I mean, first of all, yeah, like you said, wow, like, you know, what a quote. And sometimes you write things that you you couldn't even imagine saying. That's why I love writing, because writing is like the, the outward expression of your true inner self, that sometimes we get stopped by say, speaking, but it's like you when you write, it's like you can really say it. And what I mean in that quote is that, you know, blackface has been in Canada s since basically... Blackface started in the U.S. in the 1830s-ish. The first blackface came to Canada in the 1840s. So it, it, it is as Canadian as hockey. It predates hockey, you know? It pre it, it, it's always been here. There have always, it's always been a, across the country and not just in the major centers, across the country, small towns, neighborhoods. So it's deeply embedded in our culture. But the difference is, is that we just have a different culture of, of remembering. And the way that we convalesce around certain things in our co country, it's just different than in the U.S. We are also very good at forgetting <laughs> and just moving on. And also we're very good at nostal um, nostalgizing around certain things and other things just saying, well, that never happened. So we're kind of oscillating between forgetting and denial and remembering and nostalgia, right? It, there's always like this duality in Canada. And so blackface for me, is kind of one of those things where it does shape how we, maybe we don't always take, and, and I really believe this, racial caricature, what it does is that it, it, it seeps into your psyche where you cease to see that person as you see yourself. So you don't really take them seriously. So they're, they're just a joke. And, and, and to be honest, that was the whole setup of the minstrel show that the African-American man who was living in the North was the butt of the joke because they would dress really flamboyantly and have really big feet and their blackface would be extreme. They were actually mimicked because they seemed to be out of place in the industrialized North. Out of place meaning they should be in the South on the plantation. That was basically the theme of the original minstrel show through most of the 19th century. And so when we flash forward, what it means is that there's always this sense, and as a Black woman, to be honest, I, I, I even, the passage that I'm going to read, I actually address this as well, because I'm obviously a Black woman. I'm not Uncle Tom. <laughs> no one would ever call me an Uncle Tom, right? I'm not embroiled in the conversation. But why I think I sat at a unique place to address Black masculinity and, and all the, the caricaturing and, and, the, uh, and the Uncle Tomism is because as a black woman, you, you, you don't have the, and this is going to sound, maybe some people might not agree with this, but you don't have the burden of being a man. <laughs> like as much as we think that, that men have all the rights and they have all this, there is a burden that comes with masculinity because you have to project a certain image at all time. So masculinity always has to kind of be what femininity is not. And if you ever kind of just get closer to that line, suddenly there's a lot of conflict that you might have in your life, right? And so I wanted to figure out, and I could kind of see how Black masculinity gets pitted in such a way that sometimes, you know, I would say Black men really aren't as free as they deserve to be. You know, they can't just act. They can't just say this. They can't just do that. They're really contained because of the culture that we live in and these deeply entrenched stereotypes about who they are and how they should speak, how they should act. And I always go back, and I think I kind of reference it in the book, to the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Most people here have probably seen that show, and they probably remember how much they love that show. But if you really think about that show, that show epitomized exactly what I'm saying. Either your will and your quote-unquote urban and you play basketball and you're from the streets and you speak the black talk, right? You know what to say in these situations 
or your Colton who wears khakis and doesn't know the inner speaking and is wealthy and is quote unquote encoded as an Uncle Tom because he, he lacks a kind of cachet. He doesn't really know. There's no in between on that show. If you were to really go back and watch that show, they don't show you any complex black character other than those two types. And guess what? Carlton was the brunt of Will's jokes <laughs> constantly. And if you were to go back into the minstrel show, you will see that same dynamic where the one black character who was out of place will be made fun of by the character who is in the right place. And so you have this sense that why can't, and, and I think this is really at the, the center of the book. I ask, I'm asking the question, like, why can't we just let this go? <laughs> like culturally, why are we still clinging to these racial stereotypes of over 170 years since the beginning of Uncle Tom, Uncle Tom is still with us. So I'm kind of trying to figure it out. And I think in the book, I have an entire chapter, I think there's about two chapters where I talk about blackface. Because Uncle Tom, when Uncle Tom migrated from the pages of Stowe's book, the first place that Uncle Tom went to was the minstrel show. And then through the late 19th century in a genre of theater known as vaudeville, early vaudeville, there was also blackface and there was also Uncle Tom. Early film, one of the first films ever, Uncle Tom's Cabin, 1903, I believe. So Uncle Tom has been there through every single media change. There's been Uncle Tom and there's been blackface. Every single step. Even one of the first radio programs that, that came on air in the 1920s, I believe it was the Jack Benny Show, they did a radio version of Uncle Tom's Cabin and they did it in blackface, even though it was a radio show. <laughs> so it's like, and then you can think about TV. In the book, I talk about Amos and Andy. Amos and Andy was a, a minstrel show on the radio in the 1920s and 30s. When it migrated to TV in the 1950s, they cast black characters to play what had been white characters in blackface. But it was only on one condition, that they reproduced the caricatures, but they did it as black people, not as white people in blackface. So Amos and Andy, often people don't want to talk about it because it's kind of a, um, an embarrassed uh, history in, in terms of black representation on TV because they were caricatures. But why were the, they caricatures? Because they couldn't play anything else if they wanted to be on TV. And then at the same time in the 1950s, you had the counter to Amos and Andy. You had Nat King Cole, who was like this squeaky clean, spoke perfect English, everything was coiffed. So in a way he was almost a, an Uncle Tom to their caricature. So again, if you even go through the history of TV, it's like you just have these two characters that don't ever seem to go away. And part of what my book is trying to ask is, is why is that? And I think I give a reason. <laughs> um, I give a reason, but then I kind of leave it for the reader to, to draw their own conclusions at the same time. Well, you've definitely whet our appetite. So if I could ask you to kindly share a reading from the book. Yeah, so I have, first of all, um, I could share with everyone that I got my copy of the book today. This is what it looks like. And I love the spine too, because it's like, it's just, it's just going to show well on, on the bookshelf. When we get back to bookstores and libraries, it'll, it'll show very well. But what I'm going to read today is actually, or this evening, is, um, is the direct first couple of p pages from the introduction. And I chose the introduction because it just sets the stage. And also I feel like you can hear my voice and I can tell you the way that I write, if anyone is familiar with my writing on spacing, um, I write a lot of articles for spacing. Um, I always try to start with a story. So the book starts with a story that is a true story. <laughs> I did not make, all the stories in the book are not made up, okay? So let's begin. It's, um, the reading is gonna be about five minutes. I love old movies. And I love watching Turner classic movies in particular. One Saturday evening a few years ago, I stumbled upon The Great White Hope. Released in 1970, it stars James Earl Jones as boxer Jack Jackson, Jack Jefferson. The film is a biopic 
based on the life of boxer Jack Johnson, who lived from 1878 to 1946, who at the height of the Jim Crow era became the first African-American world heavyweight champion. He held the title from 1908 to 1915. I've been a huge boxing fan since I was a little kid. I first discovered Johnson when I was a teenager, but learned more about his life only when I was teaching a Black Studies course at the University of Toronto. I devoted an entire lecture to the history of Black people in sports. Johnson was truly the first African-American sports hero. Yet, he was also a controversial figure because he crossed racial and class lines in both his professional and personal life, even marrying a white woman, Etta Terry Duryea, played in the film by Jane Alexander at a time when interracial relations were not only frowned upon, but could result in death by lynching. At one point in the film, Jefferson is in Budapest shortly before the start of World War I, but not to box. Instead, he is there to take the stage in a cabaret performance of Uncle Tom's Cabin. It was an unexpected reference in a film about a boxer and one I knew something about because I've been obsessed with Uncle Tom's Cabin ever since I started studying the phenomenon of the 19th century novel and its subsequent spin-offs. When several characters from Uncle Tom's Cabin appeared as part of the film's storyline, I had an aha moment. My fascination with the novel, first published in 1852 by Harriet Beecher Stowe, began in my 20s when I read the book for the first time. I was working then as an insurance claims adjuster living in a suburb northwest of Toronto. I had heard about the book since I was a little kid, but after someone I knew was called an Uncle Tom, I decided I needed to know where this term came from. Out of sheer curiosity, I began reading the 391 page novel on the commuter train into the city. It took me almost a year to get through it because 19th century novels are pretty dense. But after I finished, I felt like I had just hit the tip of the iceberg in terms of understanding why, of all the characters in fiction, Uncle Tom has lingered on in popular culture and politics. And now I'm just going to skip a little bit in the introduction. During my first reading of Uncle Tom's Cabin, J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone was released. I had not and still have not read her books or seen any of the films but I started to see parallels between the early 21st century frenzy around Rowling's Harry and our long-standing obsession with Stowe's Uncle Tom. In some ways, Uncle Tom as a publishing phenomenon is the 19th century version of Harry Potter. After Uncle Tom's Cabin was released as a novel, Stowe's original publisher, John Jewett, sold merchandise such as mementos, game cards, and puzzles, porcelain figures, needlework, and items of clothing. These items became cross-marketing tie-ins with the novel, though they would not have been called that at that time. Similarly, there have been countless product tie-ins with Harry Potter that extend the story well beyond the printed page. There has never been a time when Uncle Tom's Cabin has only existed as a novel. Like Harry Potter, its multiple and associated images have always coexisted with the book. Rowling's, however, managed to achieve what Stowe, given her era, never had the opportunity to do. She became a media mogul, just not just a literary icon. Stowe herself is less remembered than her novel, even though she went on to become an editor and a suffragist in addition to her abolitionist work. Uncle Tom's Cabin was a phenomenon bigger than its author. In some ways, it is more synonymous with abolition today than actual abolitionists are. I'm just gonna skip again in this last paragraph. As a black woman, I must admit that it is difficult to know what it truly feels like to have someone hurl the Uncle Tom insult in my direction. I have never experienced it the way black men have. The killing of George Floyd, coupled with the deaths of other unarmed Black men and women in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, brought issues of race and anti-Black racism into clear focus. The global protests that followed shed light on the fact that while Black people have come a long way since the days of Uncle Tom's Cabin, and even the Civil Rights Movement, 
racial issues still feel as salient today as they did two centuries ago. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. That's it, so much to think about. And um, it's a perfect segue actually into our audience's Q&A. So we're gonna move into the Q&A. As a reminder, please type your questions in at the bottom of the screen and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Are you ready? Yes. yes. Um, the first is actually um, uh, a comment. And um, Carrie says uh, that she likes how you spoke about each movement. Um, so I, I, that was back when we were talking about uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And so that, that was a, a good comment and, and thank you, I agree with her. Um, Marcia says um, a statement, our hair is tied to our identity. Do you want to comment on that? It is tied to our identity, but just like your identity changes, so does your hair choices, right? So it, it's not directly, like it's, it's not, it, it's, it, how could I explain this? It's like, I think about when I was a child and the hairstyles that I was interested in as a child. I would never wear those hairstyles today, <laughs> ever. Like I, I'm a different person. I have different interests in life. So it's tied to our identity. But I think, you know, one of the things, if you take the India Iree, India Iree is an artist and she had a song, I am not my hair, right? And she goes on and on and on. And what she's trying to say is, yes and no you know sometimes my hair is a reflection of my identity and how i'm feeling and living and sometimes it's just hair it's literally it's just i'm just having fun and so one of the things even in beauty in a box which you can get at your local bookstore or library that i was trying to get at is that black women have to be given the right to also just have fun with our hair and it not always be laden with so much meaning and it's so tied we, can't we just let loose, you know? And I talk about it in Beauty in a Box. One of the things about blonde hair, for example, most people don't realize that blonde blondness is tied to an ad campaign <laughs> that really took off in the mid 1960s. And it was Clairol who said, does she or doesn't she? It was just a question. <laughs> and it was geared towards the housewife who was living in suburbia, who wanted to get back that vigor into her life. And so through the 60s and 70s and 80s, blonding became a way for you to kind of live again or recapture your youth, right? Or just, we've now equated blonde hair with fun and living. And I think one of the things about black women is that we're never allowed to have a hairstyle that we can claim as being just fun. <laughs> it has no politics, it's just fun, right? And I think we have to give ourselves space to do that. That's just my own personal opinion. Of course, people might disagree, but I think that's one thing that, that I want people to get if they read that book as well, that you got to give space for people to, to just make those choices that aren't always so laden with political meaning. So we have, um, uh, we have a, 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 a comment here from Fiona. Fiona is um, uh, a member of um, the Aurora Black community who are doing a lot of really good work in our area. And I'm so pleased to, to see her uh, at our event this evening. She says, black hair, I never desire to flash my hair when I wash it. But for me, I never had problems growing up with my hair. So which generation are you speaking of about the hair? I think you'll find aspects in every generation. I mean, it, there's no monolith, you know? So, so myself, I'm generation X. I went to high school. I went to high school with, with people, um, black women who they always knew who they were. <laughs> they never had any hair complex. They just always knew they just very confident. They never had any hair issues. They just always knew. And then I had, I went to school with people who desperately wanted to have blonde, long blonde hair and wish their hair wasn't coiled. So I think it's, it, it really is a dependent. It isn't really about um, the individual, because you're always going to find people who, who didn't have the same experience as you, right? Of all generations, even now, there are young black girls now who, who love their hair, it doesn't matter what it looks like. And then there are others that don't and wish that they, they looked different. And I think, to be honest, hair is a metaphor for your own journey in your life to get to know who you are, right? It's just like everything else in your life. And that goes for men and women. I, I always think, someone even said this to me and I really believe it's true. 
if you know a man who has always been clean shaven and suddenly they start wearing a beard, I bet you they're going through something in their life. <laughs> something is changing. Wait, maybe they're not attuned to it, but something might be going on in their life where they're feeling different about themselves and they want to, or they're maybe they're hiding something. They want to hide a bit. They don't want to be seen fully. And it's the same thing with hair. I mean, it, 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 it is really a personal quest to know who you are. And some people just always know. So it's not a hang up. Some people, they have to go on a journey. So, so Rosie asks, how do you feel about being an ambassador teaching explaining, making it a teaching moment uh, opposed to internalizing and just calling it a teaching moment. You mean that concept of, of like a teaching moment? I mean, are you calling me an ambassador? <laughs> Rosie I mean, is, yes. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I would never have given myself that title. Um, but yeah, I absolutely think that's what we're supposed to do. I see it as my job. I'm I, At the end of the day, I am an author. I do public speaking, but I'm also an educator. So for me, education is about getting people to see the world differently and to have conversations about things that maybe they are not used to talking about. So for me, it's like, that is the only way we're ever gonna, one, that's the only way we're ever gonna get to understand each other, right? And if we don't understand each other, how are you going to really move forward, right? How are you going to get over racism, sexism, classism, ageism, all the isms? How are you going to get over them unless you talk to each other? And the people who have always had a kind of power and power and privilege open up themselves to hearing from people who have never had it or who have only had it partially, and just being open to what they don't know, right? Open to an experience that, that you might not have known to be true. You know, I always think about people that you went to high school with. There are people that I went to high school with that love that high school, <laughs> right? Have so much high school spirit. And then if I meet them and um, they're talking to me and, and I'll say, yeah, high school was okay. And they're like, just okay. And then I start telling them all the things that I experienced. <laughs> whether it was really extreme racism or discrimination and all the stuff. And they're like, I had no idea. And I said, and I would always say, well, of course you would have no idea because you were living in your world and I was living in mine. And I think there needs to be an awareness from people that we all, just like we all experience our lives differently. We all experience that thing differently. So say you went to high school or you're even at the office. If you work at an office, there's a lot of people who don't even know that there could be people at your office who are really having a hard time. Like they're dealing with a lot of stuff. Whereas you say to yourself, well, I love working there, <laughs> you know? So it's about having perspective, empathy, being able to hear what other people are experiencing. So for me, thank you for calling me an ambassador of that because that's kind of just how I see the world. I think, and maybe it's because I, I grew up in Scarborough, Ontario, Toronto, whatever you want to call it. And my world has always been really diverse. From the minute I started school, there was always people who didn't look like me that I had to get along with. So I, I, I feel like it just has formed part of my identity in many ways. And also the, my, my teaching and learning style, I think, has been formed by that. Um, so Tessa says... When you talk about black hair and braids, after Bo Derek braided her hair as a white woman, gave them the comfort level that if a white woman is braiding her hair, it is a level of, approv of approval for them. Would you like to comment on that? Okay, so, so the question again, so... So, so when you talk about black hair and braids, and then Bo Derek braided her hair as a white woman, that gives a, does that give a comfort level that a white woman is braiding her hair to black I mean, women? I don't know, comfort to black women? <laughs> like comfort to who? Uh, or, or a level of approval I from the question is, is. Yeah, I mean, I talk about Bo Derek in Beauty in, the, in a Box because and it's not about Bo Derek as a person. It's the fact that in the role that she was in, which was a film, people don't know that this is not Bo Derek in her personal life. Bo Derek was in a film in 1980 called 10. And that's where that saying, oh, she's a 10 or a perfect 10, that's actually where it came from. She was in that movie with Dudley Moore, who's an actor. I don't think, I'm not sure if he's still with us, but that's an old time actor. And it was in that movie, she was wearing the, white, the yellow bathing suit and she had 
corn rolls. She had actually braided her hair and it, I guess it was braided. It wasn't really corn rolls. Point is, is that I don't give that a pass because what happened because of Bo Derek that most people actually don't know this. Bo Derek actually became part of a legal decision because there was a black, an African-American woman who was working at American Airlines at that same time. Her name was, her name was Renee Rogers. And Renee Rogers was fired for wearing the exact same hairstyle as quote unquote Bo Derek. She then sued American Airlines, citing the 1964 Civil Rights Act and saying that she was basically facing a sex and gender, I'm sorry, sorry race and sex discrimination. So she was mis being discriminated because she was a woman, but also because of her hair, she was saying that was a racial discrimination. In that ruling, okay, the judge said, basically, that's impossible because Bo Derek, you probably got that style from Bo Derek. And because you got that style from Bo Derek, that means your hair is mutable and it can change. So you're choosing to wear that hairstyle when you don't have to. So yes, you can be fired for wearing that hairstyle because you can choose not to wear it and you can keep your job. So the ramifications of that glorification of that hairstyle meant that black women were actually being discriminated against. And you can still be discriminated against in Canada and in the US, but for four states that have passed laws against hair discrimination, it can, you can basically still be fired if you're wearing a hairstyle deemed inappropriate. So for me, Bo Derek is an emblem of the issue of when a black aesthetic is co-opted into the dominant culture. And then because it's seen in such a mass audience and it's often attached to blondness, like I was talking about earlier, it gets taken up as if they invented it. And then, so when I show up wearing my hair corn rolled, which is a hairstyle that dates back to Africa, and that was worn through plantation slavery, people think that I'm mimicking Bo Derek because that's what they've seen in their worldview, right? So I just think before anyone adopts the hairstyle or the culture of any group, just get to know the group first. <laughs> that's just the standard, you know, get to know who they are. It's the same thing in South Asian culture with henna and all of that you know, don't just adopt these things unless you really know what they're for in the deep, the depth of meaning. Bo Derek was for a movie. There wasn't really a lot of meaning behind it. So you actually, um, you've looked ahead at some of the, you've actually answered some of the upcoming questions. Um, Memo wants to know what your thoughts are in other cultures, races, making hairstyles that are typically considered black hairstyles. Terry commented that it depends on the texture of your hair. So, um, so you've actually addressed those questions. Uh, here's a, an interesting question um, from Khadija who says, um, do you think there's an equivalent of the Uncle Tom trope for Black women? I think about how in the same way Black men reject Uncle Tom partially because he seems less masculine, Black women could have an equivalent that they reject because it's less feminine, for example, the sapphire. Yes, in fact, in the book, I do give the Uncle Tom equivalent, and the Uncle Tom equivalent is Mammy otherwise known as sometimes seen as Aunt Jemima. So we can think about Mammy from Gone with the Wind, for example, hey, um, Hattie McDan McDaniel. You know, Hattie McDaniel won an Oscar at the 1940 Oscars for Best Supporting Actress, actress for playing Mammy. So Mammy is the female equivalent to Uncle Tom. And I talk about Mammy a lot in the book in various chapters, because what this stereotype does is that it places Black women almost in the position of always being kind of servile as if we're there to listen and be kind. And that's why I really hated that movie, The Help. <laughs> Cause I feel like that movie, The Help just kind of really just brought that, The Help is the perfect example. It just brought that same image back that we so kind and only when we're really pushed will we fight back, but we'll fight back still in kind of a passive aggressive way. I don't want to give the movie away for those who haven't seen it, but we don't say exactly how we feel or exactly what we're thinking. And we're always kind of there to support, especially white women, we're there to support white women and 
help them out and, and make sure that their feelings come first. In the book, I actually talk about um, in psychology, they've actually started to describe this as mammyism just like they've started to call it Uncle Tomism, like an actual like psychological issue of like always feeling like, especially in the workplace, you have to be in a servile role or you have to like always help out your colleagues and, and don't take care of yourself. So the reason why these stereotypes are so dangerous is because they, they neglect black self care because if you're always taking care of other people, and serving, where's the room to take care of yourself? There really isn't any room. And so that's that would be the equivalent, not so much Sapphire. I talk about Sapphire in the book when I talk about Amos and Andy, because most people don't realize that that was the name of the character in Amos and Andy. The character was called Sapphire. That's often, I think, the reason why that name then was attached to this particular type of person who is not the mammy, subservient, servile, the sapphire is the opposite of that, really aggressive, emasculating, um, but at the same time, paradoxically seen as kind of promiscuous, right? And like, so it's almost like, I would almost compare it, the sapphire example is Medea. <laughs> Tyler Perry's Medea is a, basically a sapphire really aggressive, going to pull that gun out. But at the same time, when you watch those movies, she's always talking about the fact that she used to be a prostitute <laughs> at the same time. And then weirdly enough, then she's suddenly really loving and caring. But yet you don't see a lot of, if you take that character, there's no inward care for herself. There's no tenderness for herself. And I think that's why it's dangerous because it, it almost projects an image as if black people, we don't like, we don't really have deep feelings. <laughs> You know, like we're only just there to serve and, and emasculate men. And so it's just, there's just a lot going on. And I think, I think that's why you look at a, an actress by, the, um, by like Viola Davis. I think Viola Davis has proven um, that you can rebuke those stereotypes and still find your way in Hollywood because she's done that in many of her roles. So uh, Louise asks, Dr. Thompson, have you explored how blackface still lives covertly in cartoon characters we see all over the place, such as Mickey and Minnie Mouse? And would you be willing to comment on this? Yes, absolutely. Again, no stone unturned in the book. I also talk about cartoons a lot in the book. And I talk about Mickey Mouse a lot in the book. Um, and, and I talk about the fact that, yeah, um, in fact, in the book, I think I share a story about um, Betty Boop. Uh, when I was a little kid, I'm sure if anyone's around my same age, you remember Betty Boop. Like they brought, Betty Boop is like from the 30s and 40s, but they brought Betty Boop back in the 80s, right? So like I was obsessed with Betty Boop. And I remember when I turned 30, a friend of mine gave, brought me like a, a Betty Boop, like collector's um, uh, set. And I watched a few episodes and then I got to this one episode that I talk about in the book and it was so disturbing because of course I never, I don't remember this episode as a kid. And basically it, um, and I outlined it in the book, but I'll tell you what it is here. It's, it's where Betty Boop goes to Africa and the, the episode actually is, is, is celebrated today. Um, in the book, I tell you what it's called. So then you can go and look it up because it is celebrated today because it's one of the first animations where they had live action and animation. So it kind of predates Song of the South because Song of the, Song of the South is also celebrated because there's live action and animation together, which was kind of a technological feat like in the 1930s and 40s. So the movie starts, the, the cartoon starts live action. It's Louis Armstrong's orchestra. So Louis Armstrong, like the real Louis Armstrong is playing with his orchestra and then it cuts animation, Betty Boop is in Africa. And you're like, okay, this is a weird juxtaposition. Like you're thinking, where are they going with this? So then there's a scene where Betty Boop is like running in Africa and she, Betty Boop and her sidekicks, I can't remember what they're called now. They're being chased by like gorillas in Africa. And then the, the, the camera starts like panning in. And at the same time, you're still hearing like Louis Armstrong sing in his orchestra. 
And as the camera pans in, Louis Armstrong's face is superimposed onto the gorilla as it chases Betty Boop and the sidekicks. And then eventually when they get to like this one part in Africa, they're like around this like big bowl thing. It's all of Louis Armstrong's like orchestra. Or again, their faces are superimposed onto the gorillas. And I was, I, I was watching this as like a 30 year old woman, like, oh my gosh, these people, they weren't even trying to hide that they were doing this. Like it was so overt. And then I thought back many years into my life when, if anyone remembers this, when Toronto was thought to get the Olympics, we were up for the Olympic bid. And then the, the, the Olympic committee came and our mayor at the time was Mel Lastman. And Mel Lastman made a comment about Africans cooking people in a pot. It was like that, I just went back to that cartoon and I thought, well, where did he get that notion from? Because I had just seen that in a Betty Boop cartoon <laughs> from the thirties. Right. And so people want to know where all these things. And by the way, because he made those comments, that's the, one of the reasons they say we never got the Olympics. It was just like, can't send the Olympics there. What a faux pas. That's where these things come from. They seep into your subconscious and you don't even recognize them. So in the book, what I do is that I actually share a lot of those anecdotal stories. And I tell another story about Tom and Jerry which is another popular cartoon that also had a, a black caricature in that cartoon. And then I, what I do is that I set up the cartoon and then I explain how it affected me kind of, and then I put it into context with the time. And I think cartoons, which is something we really don't pay much attention to now because the print printed paper, right? It's not what it used to be. We used to get the printed paper and you'd look at the funnies, like there'd be a separate section with the funnies. Um, in fact, I'm still old enough. When I was a little kid, my mother knew I loved the funnies, so she would leave the funnies out. <laughs> when we got the, the weekend paper, she always would leave that on my tape, my, my seat for me to, but people don't really do that anymore. But back in the 30s and 40s and 50s, cartoons were really instrumental because they would put in the cartoon, whether it was animated or it was actually a paper um, cartoon, there would always be some kind of caricature of blackness, black male or woman in the actual cartoon. So there's just a lot of, um, in the book I talk a lot about it because you kind of can't, yeah. When you go back into the, into the history of these things, cartoons are really important. And to your point, you still see it in animation today. You can still find examples in animated cartoons where it's like the black, if there's a darker skinned character, they're not really the best character in that cartoon there'll always be kind of a sidekick or they'll always be told that they're not doing something correctly. Very subliminal. Or, or actually it's not subliminal at all. It's actually very overt, <laughs> I should say. So um, Peggy, Peggy asks, do you see similarities between black women and race relations regarding hair in Canada and in the US? Are the issues problematic for young children in schools as it pertains to natural hair and being put out of schools? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of similarities between Canada and the US as it relates to black hair. I mean, the only thing that makes our context a little bit different is because we are in many ways just a more diverse black population. We have a lot of different um, Af um, black communities coming from the continent of Africa. We have a lot of different black communities coming from the Caribbean and at different stages of their immigration, right? And then we have historically black communities that have been here for centuries, long before the war of 1812, right? And so because we have that, we all have a different beauty, in a way we all have a different beauty culture that, that kind of comes together at the beauty salon or the beauty shop but it, it's just a little bit of a different beauty culture. Whereas in the US context, I think what sets it apart is that they just have a, a less recent history of black immigration. So a lot of, um, even though of course there are still people from the continent of Africa immigrating to America, there are still Caribbean people immigrating to America, but not en masse, right? as we experienced in Canada in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Their immigration wave was really 
if we're talking about post slavery into the 20th century, their big wave was really in that 1890 to like 1930 chunk of time where a lot of Caribbean people in particular came to America. In fact, I was surprised to learn that even um, Cicely Tyson who just passed away, she was, her parents were from St. Kitts in the Caribbean. I thought she was African-American in terms of her lineage. So, but that makes sense to me because her parents, given her age, when she was born, they probably came to America sometime in the 1910s when a, a lot of Caribbean immigrants were coming to America at that time. So what makes us different is our immigration stories are, are like, a cent, like 50, 60 years apart. And so because we have a relatively new-ish uh, sort of I guess, mass of Black people living in Canada, we just have different nuances in how we engage with hair care. And I could see it, like I could kind of know that I'm dealing with people who might be from Africa and people who might be from the Caribbean in terms of whether that's their descent or like their recent immigrant. There's just a different hair culture and a different beauty culture. Now, what was the second part to that question? Because I think I know, I don't remember. Oh, uh, how it affects uh, children in school. Well, I think, I think it means that you have a different, you, you're, you're going to school with a different language. Like, I think when I went to school, most of the Black children that I went to school with, their parents were from the Caribbean. I didn't really know many people who, whose parents were directly from the continent of Africa. I didn't. But if you think about children who are in school now, it's probably 50-50. It's probably a, a mixed bag. So because when I went to school, we were culturally kind of the same, we were having the same conversations about stuff like products, what my parents were doing, what my mother was doing, like it was the same. Now, I think when black children are in school, you're realizing that, which is, which is, I think it's, it's good. It's, you're just realizing that in as much as we're racially black, we are ethnically very different. Like we have a different ethnicity. Like there are ethnicities within blackness. There are nationalities within blackness that are nuanced and different. And I think now in the Canadian black population, there's just a lot more of that, but the, and, I, and I've even said this in my classes, one of the things I hate about the way that black people get seen in Canada compared to other groups is that we do not get seen by our regional ethnic difference. Instead, we're just black. So if you were even to go on Stats Canada, often you just see the stats for black Canadians. They don't really break it down like they do for Asians, South Asians and other groups. So we're really different, we're uh, complex. So I think, I think it's in that respect, I think it's easier for young black kids in some respects in school today because they can kind of co-mingle with each other and learn different things. Whereas when w I was a kid in school, I kind of felt like I needed to cling to these people because they were the only people that really understood. Like, so there was a little, there was just a different relation with, with terms of friendship and even talking about hair and, and all those kinds of things. So uh, Irene, Irina makes a, a comment. She thanks you, Cheryl, for being authentic and genuine when you speak. And I totally agree with her. Um, and she says, um, this is my first time attending a webinar learning more about Black history. Glad you're with us, Irina. I had a good friend back in high school, and I didn't understand how it was challenging for her to be friends with four other white girls, including me. Mm -hmm. I have a general question. Is it offensive to identify a person as black? Oh, I mean, I, I say no, okay. I, but I, again, we're not a monolith. So to me, I always feel like it's just the way I compare it to my, my young students who now are all they and them, not him and her. And so I always say, how would, how would you like to, to be referred to? Like I always ask because I don't want to assume, like I might say she, and they're like, actually it's them, right? So I respect the pronouns that people want to use. And I feel like it's the same thing when we're talking about race. There are some black people who maybe don't want to be known as black. Maybe they like, you know, maybe they're like, actually I'm Ghanaian. So I would prefer it if you just refer to me as Ghanaian, as where I'm from, or I'm, I'm Canadian. I don't see myself through a race. I don't know, right? Like I never want to put words in people's mouths, but I know for myself, no, it's not offensive. I, 
I just actually have a piece coming out um, in a few weeks in a, in a, in a magazine that where I literally say I'm a black writer. And I actually like when people call me a black writer. I actually don't want to just be referred to as a writer because I'm writing from my point of view and that is a black point of view. And what that means is, is that I am expressing something that is not to be taken as the dominant culture. The dominant culture often has the luxury. For example, a white writer would never have to say, I'm a white writer. <laughs> like we'd probably be like, what? <laughs> why, why are you talking? But meanwhile, their writing is about whiteness. The writing, their writing is about their experience as a white person. It, it actually is. But for me, my writing is actually about my experience as a black person. And I like to use the word black because it just, it just to me, black is unifying because it doesn't matter what your citizenship is. It doesn't even matter if you speak English or French. It, it's just a unifier. It's like black is, yes, that's me and you. Like we don't have to get into the nitty gritties of our ethnicities or our nationalities, citizenship. All that is just like out the window. And I have definitely found that when I have left Canada and I've traveled to other places, it's like, it's just a unifying thing. You see a black person, you're gonna wanna talk to them. You're not going to ask them, can I call you black? Is that okay? <laughs> like you're just not, you're going to see them and you're going to say, okay, there's a black person. Let me see. Let me ask them what it's like to live in this space. So if you're a non-black person and you're asking like how you should address people, you just have to ask them, how would you like to be addressed? And then whatever they say, go with that. That's what I say. So um, um, this is a good question from Alex. Alex says, how can I contribute as an individual to this wonderful, inspiring movement? This is my first time learning about this movement. I mean, I feel like it's, 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 yeah, it's one of those things where, um, you know, this is going to sound funny, but you know, people say like everyone has a different love language. <laughs> where it's like some people love in words, some people love in gifts, some people love in actions, some people love in just a feeling. I feel like um, getting to know another group and culture and who they are and understand their, their struggles is, is also a kind of language. Like you have to figure out what feels authentic to you, right? Maybe it's authentic to you that you wanna now go and read different genres of books because you feel like you wanna have that knowledge. Maybe it's authentic to you to want to go and look up a black organization and you want to donate or you want to see how you can contribute. Maybe it's authentic to you to, you know, um, think about programming if there's something that you want to attend. Like, I, I just don't think there's a there's there's not one size fits all so like way. So so you have I someone pointed out that I'm being authentic. I, I actually pride myself on being very authentic. So. I always say, find the thing that's authentic to you, right? It's like, I am the type of person where I am not gonna protest on the street. That's just not authentic to me. I can do it, but it would be a performance. Does it mean that I'm not, I'm not politically engaged with the conversation that the protesters are having? Of course, but that's just not authentic. Instead, for me, I would probably write an opinion piece <laughs> or I would, I would put it on a blog like that's the way I contribute to the movement and so you just have to figure out what's what's your way and what feels comfortable for you that you're like that's also sustainable because I think that's the key right when you want to get involved in something that you've never been involved in you think you got to go gung-ho into this thing and then maybe you do it once or twice and then you're like I don't have the I just don't have the energy for this and it's because it's not authentic to you that's why you're just going to give it up so that's what I would say about that. Uh, Lisa asks, can you speak to the issue of white fragility in a Canadian context? How do you approach it? Yes. Oh, what was her name? Lisa? Yes. Thank you, Lisa. That is a, that is a question. <laughs> that is definitely a question. And, you know, you know, part of that fragility is just and I, and I think there was a TED talk actually that I saw many years ago where um, the person was talking about the fact that you have to build up 
sort of, I don't want to call it tolerance. I can't remember how she phrased it. But basically, if you have never in your whole life had to address issues of race and racism, and then at 50, someone is challenging you <laughs> to address issues of race and racism, you basically have, I think, does she call it stamina? I don't remember the, the phrasing that she used. It's like you're, they have no tools to address that because they've never had to. And so that comes out as a kind of fragility or a defensiveness or like microaggression and all the stuff that we equate, right? And so the way that I always address these things is I, I think to myself, I think about who it is that I'm dealing with, first of all. And, you know, this might not be the answer that people would expect, but there are certain battles that I just don't fight. So if I'm dealing with someone that seems a little fragile and they can't handle this and it's a lot of defensiveness, I actually try to avoid that person. I don't put effort into, into changing them or to getting them to see or, or they just have to learn because I'm very attuned again to mammyism and wanting to be there to help, to learn, to guide. I just don't do that. Instead, if I do come across someone who maybe does have a little bit of this white fragility and there's a little bit of a discomfort and, and a, maybe a bit of fear, but they seem like they want to try to push through it, right? I work with that person and I just say, hey, you know what? I, you, don't need, you actually don't need to have all the answers and you actually don't need to be um, this like really politically well-read person. What you need to do is to admit to what you don't know and be willing to learn. And then also be willing to unlearn, to understand that maybe the way you thought things were, that what you thought was true, maybe it just wasn't true. Maybe that was just what you were taught and be willing to admit that so that we could have a real conversation. Because if the truth is, if you're ever dealing with, um, and it's not always quote unquote, a white person, sometimes white fragility can actually show up in other racialized groups as well who have also never had conversations about anti-blackness in particular, especially if it's a recent immigrant coming from, you know, certain parts of South Asia, Asia, they might never have had any conversations about anti-black racism. So sometimes white fragility can show up in those communities too. And it's really about assessing who you're dealing with and are they willing to have a conversation to know what they don't know, or are they only, interested in telling you what you need to know. <laughs> so, so Peggy says, um, this is interesting, I didn't know this. Um, in California, we just added legislation, the Crown Act, to protect natural hairstyles in schools and yes. workplace. That's right. I did know that. Well, you would. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, only, that's very interesting like, yeah. I think that it took legislation. Of course, all the all the states. It's it's Oregon, New York. Uh, I think it's Oregon, New York, maybe New Jersey, and California. There's only four states, as far as I know. So I, sorry. Yeah, I was gonna say, and it took legislation, but that legislation took lobbying for years and like activist groups for years to get that legislation to pass. So, so Jay asks, what was the reception from the publishing world to your uncle manuscript? And I think this might be an inside comment because then Jay, Jay says, Evelyn and Joanne in Halifax and congrats. So you might know something about that, but what was the reception uh, from the publishing world to your manuscript? I mean, you know, it's still, right? Like it's still, it's just coming out. So there's a lot of people who are just getting to read it. And what I have heard from people who have already read it and they're like, man, this is fantastic. <laughs> like, this is like, wow. Like I got a lot of wows and fantastic. And, um, but I mean, time will tell, you know, I think while this is my second book, the reality is, is that I'm still a relatively young writer. You know, my first book was published in 2019. So it's not like I've been publishing for like decades, right? Like this is the second book in what is kind of a trilogy because the third book that I'm going to write after this will probably come out in like 2024-ish, 2023. Um, and I think that book's going to be something too. But yeah, I mean, I think people are maybe starting to 
recognize that that the first book wasn't a fluke <laughs> that there's there's something here like there's something to what i'm saying there's something to my voice like i have heard people say this too it's like the way that i write and what i'm saying it just doesn't it doesn't feel like other things that you've read before coming from a canadian author like it just it just feels very unique and so that's some of the feedback that i have received um, but a lot of the publishers that are just getting the book now, um, so time will tell what they really feel about it. So Fiona asks, what is your suggestion for parents whose children are the only Black students in that school and there is no acknowledgement of Black history? What steps can parents take? Mm, yeah, that is very tough. That is very tough. And I think I think about when I was a kid, um, that, that was basically the case. And it, things changed when I was in high school, when we had like an after school program and someone came in and volunteered their time to basically teach black history. But I don't really think they do that much in schools anymore. And especially if it's on the primary level, you can't really leave it to someone to come in. Like it's just, it's a bit more complicated now. So for me, um, and I, thank my parents for this. My parents did that work. If I went, when I went to school and I really wasn't getting any kind of black history, I'd come home and I would get black history at home. And, and that went a long way. And, and if you're asking like what you can do to change the school and to maybe get it implemented into the school, um, I think in 2021, okay, that's not the same school as when I entered school in 1981. <laughs> I'm dating myself. Now you're gonna guess like, oh, how old is she? Um, that's when I entered school, 1981, okay? In 2021, even if your child is the only black child in the school, and even if all the teachers are white, you have a, there is a corpus of black Canadian authorship that can be brought into that school. In 1981, there was minimal if nothing so you actually have something that you can go in with and say hey here's a reading list that i'm aware of have you thought of implementing some of this into the classroom here's some authors that i'm aware of right so you can actually kind of do that um, in a way that doesn't feel um like you're attacking anyone you just alert them to the fact that there is a corpus of writing. And, you know, Natasha Henry, who is president of the Ontario Black History Society, has been working very hard through that role to change Ontario curriculum to implement Black history more in primary schools. So that could be one resource for you, too, to check out what the um, OBHS is doing and, 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 and get some resources there, too. Hey, uh, Imani um, asks, do you think that the minstrel shows have had any influence on the television film industries today? If so, in which ways? Well, that's the origin of the television and film industries. Um, I talk about it in the book. And there's been many books written about this. You know, when theater, minstrel show, transformed into vaudeville, for those who don't know, vaudeville is the original var variety show. So the vaudeville show, you'd have jugglers, you'd have a minstrel set, you'd have burlesque, you'd have a singing group. A lot of early Hollywood stars, Judy Garland being one of them, started in vaudeville doing singing acts. Back in those days, they loved kid acts. There'd always be like young little kids singing and dancing before the age of 10. Sammy Davis Jr. started in vaudeville, right? When vaudeville transferred over to the silent film Th those were all vaudeville actors then when that became the film industry what did they do they plucked from the silent film that was still vaudevillians and what was the biggest thing on the vaudeville stage blackface you know the first talking picture the jazz singer from 1926 is al Jolson in blackface so blackface is deeply part of Hollywood history. And because think about in your own life, anything that is rooted in the origins of your own family, it probably keeps coming up over the years. 
if it's not in conversation, there's a picture that somebody sees, oh, what's that? So Hollywood is the same way because that is the origins of Hollywood's like cinema. You still see iterations of that in films where there's just like that caricatured character that just is there to not be taken seriously. And I don't want to name any actors because I don't want to seem like I'm hating on any one person. But if you really think of some of the Hollywood movies that you've seen with African-American male actors in a, with a predominantly white cast, some would argue they're basically in blackface without the blackface based on the caricature that they're performing, uh, almost a kind of buffoonery that they're performing. So it's deeply entrenched and I don't believe it can ever leave because it's kind of at the root of everything. And the only way it would leave is if somebody created a different Hollywood. <laughs> if there was no more Hollywood or maybe Hollywood still existed, but then there was this other film industry. And I, tell me if I'm wrong, I don't know. I don't, I don't Netflix, okay? I don't have Netflix. And when I tell that to my students, they're like, oh, I don't understand. It's like, yeah, I don't have Netflix. So maybe because Netflix is a different kind of studio system that's very different than Hollywood, someone would have to tell me if maybe the productions that you see on Netflix seem to rebuke or just seem to not reproduce some of the stereotypes that you see coming out of Hollywood films historically. I don't know. So um, the uh, next um, question is, I am a boomer, black female, in the season of preparing our hair on Sunday night with a hot comb for church Sunday morning, yes. Saturday night with a hot comb for church Sunday morning That's today. Right. <laughs> do you think black women finally have the freedom to do whatever style we want, even at the boomer age, or are we judging ourselves based in our yesterdays? Free yourself from that hot comb <laughs> if you want. <laughs> yeah, I think we are free. You're describing my, my, that's my mother's demographic. I know that hot comb very well. And for those who are not black <laughs> tonight, that hot comb was often put on a gas stove, right? You just put it right into the, on the range in the stove and you're doing it in the kitchen. And I remember it vividly when I was a child as well. If you want to do that today, go ahead. But if you don't, don't. I think black women have never been more free than this era. If you want to be... 60 and go natural if you want to be 16 and go natural go for it like there really isn't that same there isn't that same pressure or like growing up where you had to wear a certain hairstyle like that that what she's describing to go to church is because you had to look a certain way when you walked through the doors right the hair had to match the outfit same thing if you went to work you were not going to work with hair that was braided up you that hair has to be straightened i think that in the culture, I don't really feel like that's as relevant today. In some occupations, however, I think it is still relevant. For example, if you, if you work in very corporate um, settings that require kind of very corporate attire, I think it can be a little bit harder to, to wear certain types of hairstyles. So um, I'm going to, um, this is a very interesting question. I wanna make sure I, I get it all. Can you talk a bit more about the burden of masculinity? The framing of most black centered movements is typically focused on the male narrative and lens. And you mentioned that not enough attention is brought to issues that black women face. When we talk about loyalty, it is typically black women who support and encourage black men and protect black men and their masculinity. But the gesture has not until recently been returned. When I think of black beauty, I know that pretty privilege is given to lighter skinned women, which is colorism. Do you talk about the burden of black femininity on its own, as well as in response or in congruence with the burden of masculinity? Mm, that is a very good question. So good that I am like trying to think of how to respond to it. <laughs> um, yes, I think in the book, I was very careful not to reproduce that narrative of loyalty, like, like, like the question was framed, like loyalty in terms of black women being loyal to black men, um, and especially through the civil rights movement, there's been a lot of writing about that, like, like having to support these 
and black male leaders and, and the patriarchy. But I think um, if I understand the question and, and I might not be fully answering the question correctly because I, I feel like that's a question I would need to respond in an email <laughs> after I've had some time to process it. Um, I just think if, we're, if we just go back to my book, what I'm trying to say is that black men have tended to be loyal to systems and structures. The type of black men that would be labeled Uncle Tom. That's what they're loyal to, right? They're loyal to the law. They're loyal to um, the legal doctrine. They are loyal to police, as we've seen in the case of Daniel Cameron in the Breonna Taylor case. They're, they're exercising this weird loyalty to companies and institutions and structures at the complete negation of their community. So it's like a weird a loyalty that's to these things that are actually the same things that are harming our communities. And at the same time, black women have tended to be loyal to individuals. So loyal to the, the leader or which tended to be male, loyal to this person, loyal or or and or white, right? So the concept of loyalty has always deeply, I would say, divided black communities because either you're having to be loyal to the community and then if, if you're loyal to your company a little too much, then you're disloyal to the community, right? There's always this like push and pull. And so I don't wanna give any like um, definitive of like what's the right thing or what's the wrong thing. I think what I try to do in the book is to get you to think, just think about this, this sort of dyad that I'm explaining between loyalty and disloyalty and where and when it shows up and how it, it invariably always shows up. <laughs> I think that's really what I'm saying. It's like, we can't get out of this, com like this um, duality between loyal and disloyal. It just always keeps showing up as it relates to black bodies in the sort of, as I frame it, like sort of a Western capitalist society. We're always having to take a side pick a side who I mean how many times whose side are you on anyway right it's like that phrase alone is is trying to get at like you know are you with are you with us or against us and that those that phrasing in in capitalist societies comes up a lot it's not just related to black people I mean I think if I go back to George W Bush I think the first Iraq war he basically said either you're with us or you're against us and the whole country said yeah <laughs> right and so in capitalist systems, the way they're set up is that they kind of create an either or scenario. Like either you're with this or you're against it, either you're loyal or you're not. And what I try to do in the book is I try to set up, set that up and then ask you to ponder, well, is there another way? <laughs> is there another way out of this that we should be thinking about? When I started the event, I started with some questions on a, a broader uh, scale. And as we're closing the event now, because we're, we're at time, I'd like to, to close out with a question to you. Um, Dr. Thompson, COVID-19 has fueled a push to declare anti-Black racism as a public health crisis. Do you think that when we reach the light at the end of this pandemic, what we're learning now about why more people of color are dying will be forgotten. Um, yes and no, <laughs> which is, if you know me, that's the answer that I always get. So I'll deal with the yes part of it. I think the acuteness of those numbers will fade. And the acuteness in terms of the, the extreme disparity that we're seeing will kind of fade from our memory to some extent. And we'll just remember the pandemic writ large and how everyone was affected and, and all that. No, because especially in, if we're, we're just talking about COVID-19 in Canada, and I think this ties into to kind of even me being here at the Aurora Public Library in this forum, you have black Canadians have never been at a point in this country 
where we have such a public presence and voice ever in my entire life. And for the woman who said she's a boomer, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Never. And so we won't let people forget it. We have platforms, so many platforms. We have books we can write. We have people put us on the radio, on the TV, on the this. So we won't let it be forgotten. And I think that's what we have to recognize. There actually is a public Black Canadian voice. Look at, look at Marcy Ian, who was just on CTV for how many decades, now a member of parliament. That could have been so unimaginable again in 1981 when I was in kindergarten. Completely unimaginable that, that you could have gone from that industry into a position of political power in the country. So because we now have what I would consider to be this generation of Black Canadians who are two, three generations removed from when our parents or grandparents came here, that means we have a rootedness in this country that kind of can parallel what you see in the African-American context. African-Americans are rooted in America. They are America, okay? And so because of that, they we always compare ourselves because they seem to be in everything. They're, look, they're, they're rising to the highest ranks of the presidency. They're in the, the US Senate, Congress. They're in media industries, right? They're anchoring how many generations did it take for them to get there? In Canada, we are actually at a precipice where you have me, you have dozens of others writing books. So yeah, COVID-19, the specifics of how it maybe has affected Black, the, the, when I say specifics, I mean the acuteness of the disparity between how it's affected Black communities and the wider community. I think that will fade, to be quite honest. But that's what happens with history. Because then as the time passes, you remember sort of the general tone and tenor, right? Because even when we think about the depression, like the depression era of the 1930s, you never really get the nitty gritty stories of, oh, in 1933 and 1934, we don't really get the nuance between those years. We just get the depression era and a wide swath of like what happened during the decade. That is invariably gonna happen here with the pandemic. You're just gonna, even now, think back Everyone on this call, I'm assuming, is probably old enough to remember 9-11. Do we really get the nitty-gritties of what happened in the post-9-11 months, days and months, weeks? No. Now when we think about 9-11, it's remembered as a time, like a moment, not in the nitty-gritty of the days and the weeks and the months. If you were to go back into history, a lot happened in the days and the weeks and the months following 9-11. Like a lot of stuff happened. We just don't remember it. It gets forgotten. So I think those nitty gritties, absolutely. But the, the reality of it, no. People will be writing books. I'm waiting for a book to come out and I'm sure it will be written about this specific topic. And then there'll be other books written about how it's impacted education, how it's impacted um, just our connectedness in the communities. Maybe coming out of this as well, we're gonna have a much more acute sense, especially in the city of Toronto, of geographic racism, because we never really talk about that. There are quote unquote black enclaves in Toronto that are disenfranchised in many ways from the more wealthier parts of the city. And before COVID-19, maybe we never really thought of it that way because we didn't have the data to really think of it that way, right? So because of COVID and the COVID tracing, and because of the COVID tracing, it's also tracing race and ethnicity, you're really able to see, wait a second, there are pockets in the Northwest of the city that are medium income is much lower. Education levels are much lower. And guess what? Majority black communities. So I think coming out of this, knowing that, yeah, I see, I actually, I'm, I'm, I'm also an optimist. <laughs> so we have to end on an optimistic note. I see great opportunities now that we actually know. Because when you know, you can do something to change it. It's when you live in perpetual, everything is fine. <laughs> Just put that veil over everything that nothing really gets fixed and nothing ever changes. So that's a yes and a no to that question. And it's, it's a good note. The optimistic note is a, is a good place to end. I would like to thank the Writers Union of Canada 
increased funding for authors to read in public venues made this event possible. And I would really like to thank Dr. Cheryl Thompson for the work she is doing and for so generously giving of herself this evening. Thank you so very much. I'd like to thank Lucy Frechette for being our tech backup for the evening. Um, and not, not least, I'd like to thank each and every one of our attendees for your interest and for your very intelligent questions and conversation. Good night, everyone, and stay safe.